welcome to the latest episode of the Making Lean Fly podcast. And we've got a very special episode today, which we did a little bit impromptu because we've got a fantastic um, example here of how to really do a Greenbelt Six Sigma project, get great business benefit, but also at the same time, overcome some skepticism about taking a scientific approach to problem solving. So we've got three guests with me today, um, Edwin Vandenberg, Scott Parkinson, who's the star of the show, and James DeRoos, and I'll, I'll ask them to introduce themselves in a moment. But just to explain a little bit more about the episode, what we're saying is that adopting the Six Sigma approach to problem solving requires a change in the way that we think about problem solving. Many of us are initially skeptical about making that change. So in this podcast, we're speaking with Scott, a newly certified Greenbelt, actually only a few minutes before we recorded this show. Um, in our Western Approach site, which for listeners who aren't familiar with Western Approach, it's in uh, Bristol or very close to Bristol in the UK. And he's going to explain to us his personal journey through that change curve. So if you're listening for the first time or if you've listened before and not done so yet, please subscribe to our podcast. Also, there's a video cast. I do not necessarily recommend seeing us as well as hearing us, but if you choose to, you can go on the YouTube and see our video cast. But let's uh, let's welcome the guests. Um, Edwin sat next to me. He's um, he's a regular on this show now. Actually, he's part of the furniture. But Edwin, just for those people who uh, don't know you yet, brief introduction, please. Absolutely. So uh, yeah, my name is Edwin. I lead the Lean Academy within GK and Aerospace. I've been doing so for the last three years. Um, actually, I've been active in Lean and Six Sigma improvement for the last 15 years of my career. Um, and one of my main responsibilities is to roll out the Six Sigma program within GK and Aerospace. And I'm therefore especially proud to be uh, uh, featuring in this uh, episode with Scott, who is uh, definitely a, a good proof point of when we do it, that it actually works. So glad to be here, Philip. Thank you for nice. inviting me. Thank you very much, Edwin. And a great job you're doing with our Six Sigma program. Um, and James, maybe you just introduce yourself. You're a first time uh, contributor. Yes, yeah, so first time on podcast here. Um, so I'm James Duros. I'm, I'm a global master black belt. GK Aerospace. I've been with the company for about 18 months now. And um, my, my background stigma goes back 22 years. So I first became a black belt in 2000. I know that seems like ancient history, but it doesn't mean that I've forgotten what needs to be done. So, um, and hopefully that, you know, Scott will attest on that basis. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. And then finally, the star of the show, Scott, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Scott Parnes, and I've been with Western Approach nine years uh, from near the beginning of the project, the 850 project. I'm an MSA engineer, so basically I'm supporting the shop floor in the daily tasks issues when the issues arise, helping them around those issues and uh, general quality issues, PPSs, A4s. So yeah, general things like that. Excellent, thank you. Um, so maybe, you know, tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, how you got to where you are, because you were telling me earlier in our kind of pre-discussions about how you started as an apprentice and you've worked on the shop floor many years. So you're now kind of in an engineering almost kind of office space role but i think it gave you more of an appreciation of, of what happens in reality yeah i mean um, i started my apprenticeship when i was 16 and I'm, i was working in a small company 10 people which to me was the real base base of my going forward with gk because working in a small company you've got to do every job you've got to make yourself available to do every job if there wasn't this is not my job, everything is down to you or sharing jobs with people. So in that experience is really good for me because bringing it forward to GCAN, I know a lot of work that sometimes people are pigeonholed into certain positions, whereas my experience, my apprenticeship, because I did other roles, it's really helpful and brought me forward here. Um, obviously started GCAN on the shop floor as a machinist, then made my way up to PTL and then made my way into the office where I am now. Excellent. I mean, that's, that's a fantastic success story, Scott, how yeah. you've built your career. I, I, I love that. Yeah. And um, I think a lot of the listeners will probably have an idea of what Six Sigma is or their own definition of it. But I'm interested, James, what, how would you define Six Sigma? I'm trying to take away some of the myths. Um, so I go into it and say that Six Sigma is really a 
story that you're telling using data. And it's like any journey, you know, you start off with define, you know, you, you, you've got to have your, your quest, your, you know, what you're trying to fix, and then you're moving through and, you know, so, so analyze and, you, and you're looking for the evidence. So, you know, it's, it's a bit like some of these, you know, the adventure game and things where you've got to answer puzzles on the way, otherwise you don't get to your destination. And, 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 and for me, I, I think that once you can get people to realize that actually, they can get to the destination and it's just through having answered the right questions in the right way with the right evidence so suddenly that becomes engaging and then of course if you then tell that it is a, a compelling story that everybody goes i understand that and in fact I, i'd be very surprised but most but, but most six sigma projects after you present them everybody goes well that makes sense yeah and uh, well, why didn't we do that before well I always have a simple answer to that because you, you didn't take the trouble to think about asking the right questions along the journey. Yeah. And, and, and it's always easy in hindsight when you've got a good completed project like Scott's done. But, but, but the reality is that that had been going on for years where we're getting you know, one a year. You know, um, OK, we wound up having a high spot where there was four happening in a year that really drew everybody's attention to it. But, but, but the truth is that unless you actually go after some of those and look at them in a different way, you're not going to get to the end of the journey and these things are going to remain mysterious and they'll continue to trip you up going forward if you don't. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's great. And we again, in the pre-discussion, Scott mentioned how a lot of it is common sense and I'm sure he'll come back to that. But, you know, the, the, the discussion we had was that actually it's about reawakening your critical thinking. And, and like you say, using data and really challenging some of the suppositions that people have made and with data. So as, as Deming said famously, you know, um, in God we trust, but everybody else must bring data. Um, and that's that's really what Six Sigma is all about, isn't it? Um, any, anything you want to add to, add to that? Well, what I, what I like about Six Sigma is that it is independent of the process. Mm -hmm. So you can predict the quality going uh, with each of the processes by taking the Six Sigma view. Yeah. Um, the Six Sigma quality level of six means that it won't go wrong um, more than three out of a million times. Mm. And that is a, a really key thing. It, it brings you from the environment of vagueness to real numbers, real predictability, and that's what we need to have if we want to have a good product uh, with high quality going to our customer. Yeah. So independent of which process it is, you can compare it at a quality level and be uh, very confident of the outcome if you have reached uh, a high sigma level. Absolutely, that's really, really good point. So Scott, I think most people are really interested in what is this project or what was the project <coughs> that you completed? So could you maybe share with us a bit the project background? Yeah, um, project statement basically is we were getting holes, damaged holes in the spars, and um, this was causing scrap spars. We had four in a matter of seven months. So four of these spars were quarantined. Some have come back to uh, two were in the middle of being checked. So yeah, yeah, that was the basic project. And we had changes within the process, which we thought was the issue. And then what we've done, we investigate because of the green belt training I had and my 8D training, we managed to go away from everyone thinking that change was the issue to actually finding something else with, through our testing and everything like that. So which has been really good. Uh, excellent. And and just for people who aren't that familiar with the project uh, products that you make here. Yeah. So this is for the Airbus A350. Yeah, this is for the 350. This is the inner spa, which is where the main landing gear is hanging down all the titanium parts. So our whole damage was caused in areas where there was titanium, which is a harder material. So this is where we were getting our main issues, and this is the expensive areas. We'd say the cost of the parts, titanium, especially at the moment with the titanium, cost of titanium going up. Yeah. So yeah, this is where the main issues were within the product. That's fantastic. And you you actually came up, I think, with a very innovative way of testing um, and get getting the data because these are really expensive parts and you obviously yeah. couldn't test on a, a real part so what what did you do maybe explain a bit what you well did we had a we've got a test stand but this test stand doesn't replicate actual the spar in the middle of the air in a jig so we had to lift 
we had to make a little stand above the test stand, which give it a bit more flexibility to represent the spa. But this is this is another key important. It was a team effort. There was it wasn't just me. There was other people within the team who were doing this. I couldn't do this myself. I, you know, within the team we thought of these ideas. This is what you know. It's, I think it's very important that we don't just make it one person. It was a team effort within this project. I put everything together and got all the data, but initially the testing was done by some good colleagues within my department. Brilliant. It's really good. Yeah, and I, I love that the way that you you were able, and again, I think your shot four experience came in here, but you were able to look at okay, we're testing test pieces, but we're placing them in a jig. Yeah. That's not a proper replication of reality. So you know, there's a few things in your project, I think, which really stand out. First, the way that you did the project definition to really understand what's the problem we're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, the way that you gathered the data, take into account that you couldn't do the testing on real real parts and how you really took that time to, to you know, ensure that it was replicable uh, of what was happening in real life. So I'm, I'm very impressed with the way you did that up from yeah. uh, work. So that, that was that was great. But what, one of the things we always do on this podcast and uh, this episode, even though it's a special episode, we're going to do a similar thing, is we, we try to find out a little bit of a, a fun fact about the people on the on the call. So um, I've, we've, we've had quite a bit from um, Edwin over the past few episodes. So, um, James, maybe you could um, share something with, with us, a fun fact that maybe your colleagues don't know about you. Um, I have to be really, really careful on Teams meetings. <laughs> that, uh, my um, my um, Pyrenean Mountain dog doesn't start barking, so I have to pay particular attention to if there's anybody walking down the drive, because you'll go from absolute silence to suddenly deafening and not may not be out there anybody. So that's always one of those things I have to be very, very cautious with, because yeah. uh, obviously a Pyrenean town, a little dog. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm lying by the way you know it's um, it's uh, it, it's a big dog it's a mastiff and um, and it's definitely you, you can't ignore her when she decides to bark um so so that's uh, i guess fun yeah yeah and, and a nuisance all at the same time <laughs> so so it's they, they often say that dogs reflect their owners james <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got, yeah, i haven't got white hair <laughs> Well, you, but you can't ignore him when he starts to bark. <laughs> 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 what, what about yourself, Scott? What, uh, what could you share with us? Uh, well, fun facts. <laughs> well, um, my hobby is, if people don't know, and they take the mick out of me sometimes, I'm into horology, oh, so watches, watches, watchmaking, yeah. and people always take the mick because <laughs> my timing is always early as well. So it's a bit of a fun fact that I'm into neurology. I'm also very conscious. Yeah. <laughs> Probably the other way, always early. So yeah, so I suppose that is a fun fact in a way. <laughs> no, absolutely. It's certainly something I didn't know about you, Scott. Uh, so I know you've always got time on your hands. <laughs> <laughs> I love to hear these little uh, yeah. segments of what people do. So I think what would be interesting is maybe you sharing a little bit more of your experiences, Scott. But before I ask you to do that, I'd be interested, James, in your view of you know how you observed as Scott's coach. How did you see him experience the project? I think that looking on, you got somebody that started off with a very dazed, confused. Where's this going to go? Fortunately, got enough about him to actually go with it and do something rather than sit and reflect and find all the reasons not to do it. Mm. Um, then kind of got to a point where having done the right things, really didn't know how to put it together and work out how to deal with some of the gaps. A key stage in the sort of in the sort of coalescing of thoughts and again he goes back to that story once we've got it starting to look like a story you can see what the gaps were yeah and then i think that made life easier for yeah. for you scott to actually go oh that's what i got it and why more importantly it's not the what's that's going to be it's why you're doing it so that you can then get a, an answer that's informative and actually do, does tell you something rather than it just be oh i've done some stuff because i was told to do it yeah 
Yeah. So, so that's my take. So I think we got you from somebody who's dazed and confused through to somebody that got got got, got over the finishing line, thinking, "How the hell did they get here?" <laughs> <laughs> so, how did this go? You, you know, maybe your perspective. How did you personally experience this process? Um, I think it's because I've got thirty-five years' experience. I think sometimes you think it's common sense, and this project and this course has shown that. There's a lot of things that you need data and it's really helped me going forward with PPS is where I say people say it can't be that we've been doing this for 10 years. Well, prove it to me, show it to me. Yeah. Give me the data, you know. And I think the project was, like I said, when I started it, it's a key GCAN thing philosophy I've always had is ownership. Mm -hmm. When I was put on the project, you've got to take ownership of it. It's your project with help from James and then we worked our way through it. Like I said, like James is right at the beginning when I was put on the course and then was up film and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> 52, 51 years of age. <laughs> Do I really want to be doing this sort of stuff now? But, and actually when we come away and then James has helped me as well and it's, and with help from the team, it's really, yeah, it's, it's good, valuable. And I would say it's really helped me going forward when I do my PPSs and help shop floor with issues. It's really helpful excellent yeah, yeah. And you you mentioned pps's which again for those not aware it's a practical problem solving approach yeah. um you know you're you're coaching people in how to do that scott so again you're able to to give wider than just your own imp um, uh, impact you can give out yeah. wider by helping and coaching others so that's that's really really great what what's as, as head of the academy Edwin, you know, you, you've seen a lot of it. What, what's your view of this as a Greenbelt project? You take a look in general around Six Sigma projects, very often people tend to get lost. People get overwhelmed with everything that they think they need to do and they need some guidance. And the guidance actually is built in into the framework of the MAIC. And what we've done is we've basically per phase say, said, these are the questions that you typically want to answer. And if I look at what Scott has done, he's actually taken that to heart. He's really looked at what is the first phase? It's the defined phase. And in the defined phase, there is a project definition to be built. And the way you built your project definition was by challenge. You basically said, do I really understand? Can I really answer the questions yeah. that are there? Like, what is the voice of the customer? How does that translate into my particular situation? What is the real answer to it? How can I make the problem measurable? What's the KPI that goes with it? And as an example, first you thought, well, it, the cause of this all is the broken drill bit. You've told us about that. And that's the, the, it's more the symptom than anything else you found out. But then you need to ask the question, how do I really measure what's going on? What is the, the problem really, the problem statement? And what's the KPI that goes with it? And I was thrilled to hear your story around, well, actually, if you take a look at single hole drilling, we're doing a really great job. It's a very high quality level. So that's that was the wrong answer to the right question. Can you maybe elaborate on, on that what you and your project when you found the real answer? Yeah, I mean, when we did the study, when hole wise, it was four holes last year caused these issues. But as percentage over the years, it's 0.01% we worked out, but when you actually define it as a spa, it was 9%. So this is this is where I'd say I wasn't wrong, but I was looking at it at a different angle. And then with the help of the green belt and James, now I actually looked at it, well, it was a 9% scrap rate because it was a spa. But as and how many holes we drill in Western Approach, as a percentage, it's high quality. Yeah. Because of if you, but because of the green belt train, I looked at it. Well, it's a spa, so now we're looking at a different angle, not just the whole, how many scrap spas we actually had. So, yeah. yeah, if you take a look at it that way, and if you take then a look at what you've done throughout your project, it was systematically going through all the questions, having conversations with people about what could be potential answers to these questions, what tools could I use to prove or disprove. And you systematically said, yeah, that's now a green, so it's not causing the problem. That's now a an amber. We need to do some more testing around it. Or hey, we've definitely found something that could be, and we build a test mm -hmm. to really prove or disprove this. 
and with that it was textbook it was exemplary the work that you've done so i've seen quite a few yeah. and to answer your question was a bit of a long answer <laughs> but to answer your question i think this was an exemplary way of the way that you went through with a really really great result there's so not only for you as a, as a learning journey but also for the business by the way yeah, absolutely. I've picked up on something which is a common failure of, I mean, a lot of the projects I've seen, and and, and therefore, you know, whilst I shouldn't sort of say it's like to be the case, but I suspect it's when people are doing A3s and they're doing other. I think I think it comes back to what Scott said at the start. They don't sort out what the problem is. You know, what's the problem? Then? You know, which which I know I asked the question in a different way to you. You asked what's the problem to be solved. You know, I, I kind of look at it with well. You know, what are you trying to fix? Yeah. You know, but, but it all keeps coming back to actually, you know, what's the entity that you're trying to get a solution for rather than the symptoms? Because everybody seems to like getting drawn in by the symptoms. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, think, I think we're confident we know the answer, but we're not really sure about the question, are we? Mm. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that's, that can be the problem. And, and it's interesting listening to the three of you and talking about the process. You know, I think one of the common barriers of people doing in a Six Sigma project is they believe that it's it's overcomplicated, it takes too long. But I guess you could counter that by arguing, well, if you know the answer already, if you say the answer is very simple, then the project should go very quickly because you should be able to prove very quickly with data that you're right. And, and I suspect if people take that attitude and say, right, I'm going to do this project quickly because I know I'm be able to prove it, they'll often find that what they think is right um, because the data will start to tell a different story. We actually have a few of those projects uh, yeah. in the Netherlands right now, and I won't mention any names because that would be nice, but where we're, we're showing that people thought, hey, this is going to be an easy one. Yeah. I'm just going to follow what I think is the right course of action. And then we ask the questions, and we simply don't like the answer because the data is telling us it's not true. Right. Well, no, that's interesting. Well, when we've met before, I mean, you know, somebody asked the question, well, when you should use hypothesis testing, and, and, and I said then, and I'll say again, well, if you've got the data, then test the data. Yeah. And you can do the hypothesis because it takes minutes. Mm. So, so I don't understand if you've got the data, why you wouldn't test it. Yeah, you but what, one of the things we pride ourselves in the Lean COE is doing what I describe as a pracademic approach, a practical approach, but underpinned by data, the academic side of it. Um, but we're not a university, we're a business, so we want to make sure that it is that practical application. I know it's a loaded question, but please answer honestly. Do you, do you see that we've got that balance right? Yeah, I do. I mean, a lot of the practical stuff I've learned on this, I've implemented in other places. So it's, yeah, I think it's really good. Um, the time I took on the project, sometimes people question that, you know, how long is the project taken, which is understandable. It's away from my work environment obviously you know if i'm doing this project i'm not doing my work but in a the bigger picture is and you, it will help me in my own work and my daily job so i think it's a good thing excellent thank you scott really yeah. really appreciate that and and let's you know we've had a very long drum roll what are the benefits for the business you talked about we had a 9% failure rate, so maybe show us what's the failure rate now that we're seeing and anticipating in the future, and what's the financial impact for the business? Well, the failure rate at the moment is 0% since our controls have been put in place, and uh, containment obviously first, then controls. Uh, we've had a zero failure rate, uh, and then going forward, we've got a uh, new Siemens uh, coming on site, and they're developing a torque monitoring system, so this has come out of the project as well, which is going to be put on all the machines, which is going to be so if the drill does go the torque will pop in stop the machine before it damages as far and this is all of development from this project so we've got a containment we've got the control in place but we're just doing like a belt and braces sort of thing let's have another uh, protection for the machines for the product and uh, we had a cost saving of 120,000 pounds on this project wow which is good yeah it's impressive so yeah it's impressive and we normally benchmark around 50 60 thousand pounds for a, yeah. a a project so that's that's impressive that you've uh, you've made such a such a saving uh, very uh, very pleased to hear that thank, thank you. you thank you very much 
Um, so I, I guess we're kind of getting to the to the end of, of this now. Um, but what I'd love is some advice from you, Scott. So if anybody's listening who's you know never done a Six Sigma project, um, or, or maybe they did back in the day and they've never reused the, uh, the 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 learning that they got from that, you know, what would your advice be? Um, Probably, probably a good start to be on another project, another course, blah, blah, blah. But I, in my work now, people come to me now because I know they're doing a green belt. They know I understand problem solving. So they come to me now and ask me to run PPSs where I normally they wouldn't have because they know I can actually run it and have the correct tools on board with me. And also it's really, yeah, so the shop floor is They've taken it on board, they think, you know, they were probably skeptical as well, but now they know I've got all these tools. That when we do a PPS A4, they know they've got someone there who can help, guide. So yeah, so I think it's very much skeptical to start, but people do use it and it is it's all extra tools for problem solving, which is I think is really good. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. And you mentioned uh, A4 a couple of times, which isn't kind of a standard. We know about A3s, a, yeah. a practical problem solving approach. You talked about A4s to me earlier, and those is it's kind of a Western approach developed uh, uh, um, format where you yeah. do five Ys. It's five kind Ys. Of, yeah. So every every QN, every oversized whole QN is an A4's rate. So everything that's incorrect, an A4 is rate. So we do an A4 first, five Ys. If the action is found in A4, that's good. Very simple. You don't you don't require to do a PPS and things like this. If the answer's there, use it. Yeah. Don't go digging deeper if you can find the answer straight away with an A4, which takes 20 minutes. So it's some quick and easy problem solving. Yeah, really engages the shop. Floor. Yeah, and this is really developed. At the beginning of the project, obviously, we'd have an issue, but we were so firefighting getting the next bar in. But now the project's matured, we've got the time to raise the A4 every time we have an issue. Yeah. And then the intention is raising the A4 five Ys doesn't happen again. That yeah. is the main goal, which is what we want. We want less scrap, zero defects. That's what we're all aiming for. So it's very important. Excellent. Oh, fantastic, Scott. Fantastic. So, you know, great advice, great project explanation. I just want a, a couple of final words, uh, brief words from uh, James and Edwin really just with a question what advice would you give to people so James work out what question you're trying to answer perfect well then <laughs> Edwin refresh your critical thinking <clears throat> so challenge yourself are you really getting to the root cause and if not well maybe Six Sigma maybe doing a green belt project is the way for you to really start thinking differently taking a different look at the same issue and refreshes the way that you can see problems and their solutions. Excellent, excellent, great, great final word. So thank you, Edwin. Enjoyed having you on the show again. Thank you very much, James. First time won't be the last, I'm sure. Um, and, and Scott, it's been a pleasure spending uh, this, some time this morning with you, you seeing much. your project, doing the, the certification board. And um, yeah, I'm very proud to have my signature on your Six Sigma certification because thank you. It's, uh, it's very, very well deserved. Yeah, so am I. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Absolutely. So. To those listening on the podcast or watching on the video cast, um, hope you enjoyed this. Hope this special uh, episode gave you a different insight to what we normally do. Um, and remember, it's about changing how you lead, not who you are.